Hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome to VMR. We're so glad to have you this evening. Um, I see some familiar faces. Um, I think uh, Dhruv is joining right now, um, Diago. So it's so good to have everyone here. Um, we are looking for two discussants, as well as um, someone to uh, present a case, um, but it sounds like Travis has a backup case if needed. And then I was just going to do a short reflection on the case yesterday um, that um, Robert Weber was so kind to present to us. So it was a case of a young patient um, in her 30s who had presented with neck fullness and then like some joint pains, um, fatigue, things like that, um, had gotten a course of... Um, Ozeltimivir for that, and then like steroids, and just like it wasn't a super clear cause. But then on further review, there was a lot of other symptoms like hypertension, hyperglycemia, and then um, her teeth had actually started getting gaps in them that kind of, and then loss of menstrual cycles that made you wonder kind of if there's something else going on. So we talked about kind of the differential for neck fullness, which is not something I thought about a lot. Um, but we thought about, you know, could it be something related to the lymph nodes, something related to the thyroid gland, or just like edema um, in general um, that could be causing it, or some other sort of like mass or tumor, and some of the things that we discussed. And then we kind of tried to link it to the other causes, and we pretty quickly arrived at, like, we think that there's probably something endocrine going on just kind of with all these various um, organ systems affected. And so we went through, a, I think there was also some diaphoresis of the skin and kind of said like, what could connect them? We talked about maybe thyroid gland, but there wasn't um, any goiter on examination. Um, and then we talked about like with the gaps in the teeth, like could this be acromegaly? Um, and it really fit the illness script for a lot of things um, such as the hyperglycemia, um, the hypertension, the diaphoresis. And in the end, um, there was a pituitary adenoma and the final diagnosis was acromegaly. Um, but one really good thing, one interesting teaching point that Robert taught us was that often the diagnosis is significantly delayed, often by years. And so even though in VMR, it's easier to kind of, when you have all this some symptoms and everything. Um, later it came out like there was enlargement in shoe size. It was very classic, but oftentimes in real life, you have to ask those questions um, to get the history. And so it's a lot harder to make that diagnosis. So I thought that was a really cool case and a lot of teaching points. One thing I learned was about some of the joint symptoms. You can get um, arthropathy from it, which is not something I connected with it before. Um, so on that note, I was going to see if anyone has volunteered to either discuss or present a case. Uh, Jack, have you heard anything? Not that I have seen in the chat yet, um, but we do have a volunteer for a discussant from Ravi. And I think we are looking for, yeah, ideally one more discussant as well. And then if somebody has a case too, please, please feel free to, to volunteer to present. We will hold the silence until there are volunteers. Is there anyone out there who is interested in joining um, Anne Marie, Ravi, and myself in the lukewarm seat? It's very fun. Uh, you'll get a chance to say your thinking out loud. We have Drew available too as a backup. Thank you, Drew. But if somebody else um, would like to try for one of their first times or one of their first few times, you are of course always welcome. <laughs> 
Oh, that's great, Drew. We would love to have you present a case. All right, why don't we go ahead and move forward then with Ravi and Drew. And then if somebody has a case to present, please, please feel free to volunteer um, to present a case. I can just uh, present my case, uh, I guess, if, if nobody else has one. That works, Travis. That sounds good. Let's do it. And um, a big shout out to Valet today, who is doing both scribing and teaching points. Um, so I'm, I know she's going to do a phenomenal job. Perfect, you guys ready for me to start? All right, so we have a 54 year old man with a recent diagnosis of bullous pempagoid, presents with new bleeding from his blisters. And I'll leave that as the first aliquot. Uh, Jack, do you, do you want um, me um, who do you want to take the first aliquot? I have no, uh, I have, I have absolutely no preference. I leave it up to, okay. yeah. Uh, Robbie, do you want to, um, discuss with me? We can discuss the first aliquot. Yes, I'd love to. Okay. So what are some of your thoughts here? Yeah. My thoughts are when I, when I hear bullets pempicoid that translate into me like autoimmune blistering disease. Um, so patient does have a history of autoimmune condition. In addition, patient uh, reported uh, he has a new bleeding from his blister sites. Uh, either it could be trauma related or may, we need to check his PTINR uh, or we need to check his, uh, his platelet counts. Could be that one of those possibilities, the coagulation pathway uh, in addition with that, could be medications patient may be taking, such as Coumadin, Warfarin, or Eliquis, or any one of the anticoagulation medications could cause him to bleed. But he says that recent diagnosis, so he's a 54-year-old male with a recent diagnosis. Uh, so the recent diagnosis, I'm thinking autoimmune conditions. Uh, so sometimes autoimmune conditions like run together, like thyroid, and uh, like lupus, but he's a male. That's kind of interesting to me. And he's 54 year old male. Usually I see autoimmune conditions in a female. Uh, and uh, those are my initial thoughts. Yeah. Okay, I, I love those thoughts. So I think kind of some of the things I'm gonna highlight that you talked about were there's an autoimmune history. And so we know that things can run together. So, you know, is, is an autoimmune disease leading to more autoimmune diseases and maybe like perhaps antibody formation um, leading to a um, autoimmune condition. But then also think about this as a recent diagnosis, like how was the original diagnosis established, um, which Travis highlighted in the um, chat that it was biopsy proven. So thinking like, did we get our original um, diagnosis right? I do not have kind of a lot of insight. Um, I'm not a germ expert, but I completely agree with you. And there's abnormal bleeding. I'm thinking about kind of the things involved with hemostasis. So like vessel. Um, so are there intact bl blood vessels? Is there some sort of um, vasculopathy or vasculitis or some sort of, you know, something leading to, um, decreased integrity of the blood vessels um, could be vitamin related, could be like trauma or autoimmune related or something like that. And then um, I agree, like thinking about trauma and then thinking about like the coagulation um, cascade as well. So you highlighted some really important ones, um, thinking about, you know, primary, so with platelets and then secondary about kind of the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway and all the things that are 
needed for coagulation. And I always like to remind myself with primary with platelets to not only look at the number, but if the number is normal to think about um, also things that could um, cause normal platelets, but that don't function normally like uremia, um, like von Willebrand's um, disease and things like that. Um, and then you um, talked about like the intrinsic and extrinsic um, pathway. And so, you know, this late in life, it seems less likely to be genetic. So I am thinking about like, is there some sort of medication at play or could there be some inquired inhibitor um, at play um, as well that could be leading to the um, abnormal kind of coagulation um, cascade and things like that, especially with the autoimmune um, history. And then, yeah, I'm wondering, is this just kind of a complication of the um, vessel integrity itself? So I would definitely love to know if there was any prior bleeding episodes or if this is the first time and there was bleeding in any other um, place or any other kind of systemic signs of a vasculitis or anything like that. I'm ready to hear more. All right, perfect. Um, so his bleeding started about two days ago. Um, he noted some oozing from the wounds that he had had. Um, he denies any increase in pain to the lesions. Uh, the bullous pemphigoid was diagnosed about three months ago with a biopsy. Um, he was treated at that time with topical and oral steroids. The uh, blisters were slowly improving uh, from when they initially started. Um, they, when they first started, the, the lesions were not bleeding. So this is, the bleeding is a new thing. Um, he denies any other bleeding anywhere else. He denies any bruises in his mouth, any petechiae uh, on his skin. Um, he does not take any other medications, um, has no other past surgical history or, or past medical history. Um, he doesn't smoke, drink, or do any drugs. And um, I think that's it for the next aliquot. Oh boy. All right, fantastic. Take it away, Drew. Go ahead. <laughs> so, yeah, this is um, this is an interesting case. Uh, one question that I did have um, for you, Travis, did you um, were you able to figure out whether or not he had um, uh, any uh, issues with his joints, like um, joint pain or uh, joint stiffness um, or anything like that? No, no joint pain, no joint swelling, no joint stiffness. Okay. So, which means hemarthroses are not necessarily out the window, but very unlikely in this patient. Um, there was a discussion in the chat um, about bolus pemphigoid having a very rare complication of um, essentially acquired hemophilia due to autoantibodies against factor eight, which if you don't have that factor, that's the, um, uh, that's the cause of uh, uh, hemophilia A in, if you get it at birth. And it's interesting that he wouldn't, that he didn't have hemarthroses, but that's more likely a late complication of, um, of hemophilia, particularly if you're uh, essentially bumping into things, you're getting bruising into, uh, bleeding into the joints. Um, other than that, I'm still trying to think of ways that this patient could have a, uh, have a bleeding diathesis or uh, something else. Um, and a lot of it is just coming up with not much of anything. Um, he's not on any medications like Warfarin or um, uh, eloquence that could be causing it. Um, he's, uh, I don't see any, uh, doesn't seem like there's any evidence of trauma. Um, yeah, uh, at, at this point, I'm thinking that we may have, we may get a little bit more clues on the physical exam, but I want to go to labs. I want to I want to get a full coagulation panel, look at platelets, and um, maybe get mixing studies on him if we uh, when we get when we get to that point. I think you're 
analysis of the case is excellent. Drew. I really have nothing to add in terms of like the primary considerations that we should be thinking through right now, right? But just to sort of um, uh, try to be explicit and systematic, we can we can go through the exercise of right making word associations or disease associations with abnormal bleeding and bolus pemphigoid or abnormal bleeding and autoimmune disease, and that may very well be the direction that we are going and. If we were to be seeing this patient in clinic, right, somebody who has an overwhelming inflammatory autoimmune skin disease who is bleeding, I think the first question that we would be asking ourselves, right, is, 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 this, is this bleeding that is out of proportion to the expected disease progression, right? Blisters in and of themselves can certainly bleed. Patients who have been treated with topical medications for autoimmune skin diseases can also have bleeding complications, right? Whether that's from thinning of the skin, related to topical corticosteroid use, whether it's for the potential complications of any sort of auto autoimmune therapy and the ways in which those things can predispose someone to bleeding. So I think in reality, as Drew is alluding to here, right, the question that we first have to answer is, is this bleeding, right? I think it's probably unfair to say, to ask the question, is it pathologic? Because certainly it is abnormal for somebody to have poorly controlled bleeding, but is this bleeding related to the bolus pemphigoid itself and a part of the normal disease trajectory? Is it related to a complication of the bolus pemphigoid, potentially like another autoimmune phenomena, or is it related to a bleeding disorder completely separately, right? So bleeding disorder, yes or no, is really where the majority of our cognitive energy should be. And at this point, then the question is, well, how do we answer that question? As Drew said, we can use the labs, right? We can look for platelet disorders like thrombocytopenia, or coagulation disorders, whether it's an, an elevated PT, an elevated PTT, or both, or there may actually be not necessarily abnormalities in the amount, but abnormalities in the function, whether the patient is having platelet dysfunction from uremia or dysfunction of the coagulation cascade related to a factor deficiency or a factor inhibitor. And then the other thing before we have labs, right, is we can sort of start, start to look for, is this bleeding behaving in a way that um, uh, uh, alludes to there being abnormal clotting happening, right? If we apply pressure for a prolonged period of time, is the bleeding not stopping at all? Um, um, and so again, I think like looking to see, right, bleeding skin can come from disorders of bleeding or from coagulopathies, but it could also be from a problem in the skin, which is where we already know that it is. And so at this point, while I completely agree agree with you, Drew, right? The labs are probably gonna help us further localize this. There's other things that we can look for on exam to get a sense of, is this actually a dermatologic process in which the end result is bleeding or is this truly a coagulation pathology that we're dealing with that's happening to manifest based off of the skin findings, right? Things like mucosal bleeding, petechiae in the roof of the mouth, what those explicitly help us to localize to is usually gonna be problems in platelets, whether it's thrombocytopenia or platelet dysfunction, right? Patients who have pancytopenia or leukemias, for example, will oftentimes have gum bleeding as one of the early manifestations. And we don't see that there, which maybe decreases the probability of a platelet abnormality and increases the probability of, if it is a bleeding disorder, something involving the coagulation cascade. But at this point, I think, right, depending on what the exam and the lab show us, I don't feel com comfortable, right, investing all of our cognitive energy in the bleeding disorders bucket, because this still could all just be a dermatologic disorder that we're seeing severe manifestations of at this point in the case. We wouldn't want to make any rash decisions in that regard. You guys ready for the next aliquot? So um, for the next aliquot, um, his exam, his vital signs are normal, afebrile, heart rate 80, blood pressure 130 over 70, respiration 16, O2 sat 99% on room air. Um, he was generally alert, oriented, no acute distress. Uh, cardiovascular pulmonary exams were normal, abdominal exam normal, neuro exam normal. Um, skin exam just showed um, multiple um, skin lesions on his chest, upper and lower extremities, kind of in multiple stages, some scab, some uh, unroofed, um, with a few of the lesions uh, were oozing, just kind of bright red blood, you know, when, when they were touched. Um, but there was no petechiae, um, no, um, uh, no bruising anywhere else, 
some of the blisters kind of looked, um, you know, like hemorrhagic. And then I can give you um, a first initial uh, lab results. So white count was six with a normal differential. Hemoglobin was 10. Don't have a baseline. Platelets were 240. His uh, basic metabolic panel was normal. Um, liver function tests were normal. And he had an INR of 1.1 and a PTT of 88. And that's the end of that aliquot. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so looking at the vital signs, uh, patient is afebrile. So that's a good sign. There's no uh, signs suggesting of cellulitis, a superimposed infection, and his bullous uh, bleeding sites. And he's not tachycardic. Uh, that means it's not that inflamed or I mean, he's not tachycardic. That's a good sign too. But, but, but in, a, in, a, in other words, vital signs are reassuring. And he's alert, no acute distress and oriented. So those are all good signs, uh, again, reassuring. And the extremity exam, multiple skin lesions on his chest, lower extremities, which is consistent with his bullous femicoid con uh, condition. And there's some uh, oozing noted. Coming to the laboratory data is anemic, hemoglobin of 10, mm. hemoglobin of 10, and uh, platelet counts at 240. This is normal. Iron is 1.1, it's within normal range. PTT, I guess that's elevated, 88. Uh, I think that's elevated. Uh, I look at my normal range myself. Uh, that is, uh, yeah, I, according to the computer, normal is between 25 to 35. Uh, PTT, when it's elevated, um, I'm sorry, I'm thinking, is it like Wild Willibrand disease or? Uh, I, I have, I'm sorry, I had to look at myself what the elevation of PTT. I know there's a lot of conditions, uh, can right now think of some. I'm thinking like either one Willibrand disease or G, I don't think patient has DIC. Um, yeah, maybe it could be a patient who may have like antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. That's all I can think of. Sorry about that. Oh, Ravi, what a great discussion. Um, kind of some of the things I took away is looking at the um, other exam, we're not getting a lot of signs of other bleeding. There's not petechiae, which makes me think less about the platelet problem here. And so I'm kind of more thinking about coagulation cascade, and it doesn't look like looking at the skin lesions, they don't seem like really deep. It doesn't seem like there's been any medications that could be associated with thinning of the skin. And it seems kind of like diffuse oozing. Um, and so that in combination with the elevated PTT makes me think that this is probably more a coagulation um, cascade issue. And I completely agree with you. Um, when I think about the coagulation cascade, I'm thinking about the extrinsic pathway, um, which is just basically factor seven and is um, reflected in the INR. And then I'm thinking um, about the intrinsic pathway, which is basically everything except seven and 13. Um, but the kind of big ones I think about are eight and nine, um, are kind of like your big players I think about. Um, they can both be associated with hemophilia, which would present earlier in life, but can also have acquired um, factor, like antibodies that can lead to factor deficiencies, um, both 
eight is more common than nine, but nine can occur as well. And then I completely agree with you. We also need to think about von Willebrand's factor can also cause an elevated um, PTT. And then DIC, the INR is normal, which makes me think that DIC is less likely. Um, and then also sometimes vitamin K deficiency. But again, the INR, usually vitamin K deficiency affects the INR first because seven has, has a shorter half-life. So the fact that that's not involved makes me think that that's less likely. And then I completely agree with you that um, I'm also thinking, you know, when I see a um, elevated PTT, I also do think about um, uh, antiphospholipid syndrome, but the fact that it's bleeding primarily, it kind of makes me shy away from that. So kind of thinking about next steps, um, I would be trying to localize, you know, what factor is causing the elevation? Is it all the factors or is there one specific one? Um, specifically thinking about, um, you know, factor eight and nine. If you're concerned about liver disease, you can also um, send like a factor five to help um, differentiate um, what could be going on because factor eight is the only one not produced in the liver. And so um, that can be like help differentiate if there's liver disease. It doesn't sound like that's the case here. Um, and then I also be thinking about a mixing study because I'd want to know if it corrects when given factor or if there's an inhibitor. And so it won't correct when you um, put it together with normal factors. So those, those would be kind of some of my first steps here. You guys ready for some more information? All right, well, you ask and you shall receive. So um, they checked a mixing study, um, which did not correct. Um, lupus anticoagulants were negative. Um, von Willenbrand factor, um, all, all those studies were negative. Uh, factor eight activity was sent and was um, 3%. And that is the, the, the next information will, will be the diagnosis. I think the diagnosis has already been given away. <laughs> um, so factor eight activity of 3%, mixing study did not correct. This looks to me like an acquired looks to me like acquired hemophilia A. Um, it's interesting to note that the patient did not have hemorrhoses uh, with this, but given the fact that he, you know, had this uh, episode of bolus pemphigoid about three months ago, I'd say, yeah, he probably didn't have it long enough for the hemophilia to actually manifest with all the complications that it usually does. Usually you'd see hemorrhoses in, um, uh, in patients who've had hemophilia that was from, uh, from birth. Um, as for the, uh, as for the actual like factor, um, things, trying to think of what the treatment would be for this. I would imagine it would probably be give extra factor and, um, uh, and rituxan, but Otherwise, yeah, because if we, yeah, my little brain factor is normal. Uh, I would imagine it's normal in both amount and function. Uh, we don't have lupus anticoagulants. Um, he seemingly, since he was outpatient and being seen probably in the ED, he probably has not gotten heparin. Um, so, yeah, this this looks like an acquired this looks like an acquired um, uh, factor eight inhibitor and uh, would probably so this patient probably needs recombinant factor eight and then I would imagine probably rituxan to get rid of whatever cells are producing um, the antibody that's uh, inhibiting factor eight. And nothing to add to Drew's discussion of what the um, uh, what the ultimate cause of this patient's bleeding is. I guess the two things that I will reflect on here, um, given that so much um, so much fantastic analysis has already been outlined, 
Um, is one sort of if we think about mapping backwards and trying to better understand this patient's clinical presentation. Drew very astutely pointed out that most patients who have hemophilia A or a hereditary factor eight deficiency, um, these patients will oftentimes present with heme with heme arthroses, but actually in the acquired form of the disease or an, or an acquired factor eight inhibitor, heme arthroses are actually unusual and we oftentimes see manifestations in the form of mucosal bleeding, whether that's epistaxis, oral mucosal bleeding, gastrointestinal bleeding, or the urothelial mucosa patients presenting with large macroscopic hematuria. So it is spot on, right? The, the overlap between, between hereditary hemophilia and acquired hemophilia is substantial in terms of the laboratory testing, but the clinical manifestations, while they also will overlap, the sort of um, the one, one primary area in which they differ is hemarthrosis. And so I guess the, the main teaching point to download is that the absence of hemarthrosis in a patient who is presenting with a bleeding disorder in elderly age should not dissuade you away from a factor eight inhibitor being present. Um, the other clinical features of this case that I think are useful to highlight in terms of thinking about this diagnosis is one, the age, the vast majority of patients who have an acquired factor or who have uh, uh, an acquired factor eight inhibitor will present above the age of 50. So oftentimes it is a later presentation of a bleeding disorder, whereas usually patients um, uh, uh, who have a hereditary bleeding disorder will present much earlier, as many of you have alluded to in the chat. And then like many diagnoses in internal medicine, Finding the presence of a factor eight inhibitor, which we can say is there because we have a mixing study that fails to correct and then a low, a um, abnormally low factor eight activity level, right? Once we can make that diagnosis, that diagnosis is actually the start of a whole other journey, which is how can we explain the underlying etiology of the acquired factor eight inhibitor? There's essentially four big categories of disease to think about. Um, the first one is going to be idiopathic, right? In, in, the, uh, in the majority of these cases, there is not an underlying um, disorder that is leading to the development of the antibody. So, um, malignancies can do it, particularly solid organ malignancies of the larynx or the uh, esophagus. Systemic autoimmune diseases or connective tissue diseases, whether it's lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, or in this case, potentially bolus pemphigoid is the patient's underlying connective tissue disorder or the systemic autoimmune disease that is predisposing them potentially to the, to the development of this. And then the other, the other category is that drugs can do it. Patients can have a drug-induced factor eight inhibitor. Um, and so I would say, right, though we, we, we have a plausible explanation here in a patient um, who has pemphigus or um, bolus pemphigoid, who's presenting with an acquired factor eight inhibitor, right? That could be the link. And I think it's worth asking ourselves, is there potentially an underlying malignancy here that is actually triggering this, acknowledging that patients who have systemic autoimmune diseases, including something like bolus pemphigoid, are also at an increased risk, a slightly increased risk of solid organ malignancy. And so I think one sort of question to have in the back of our mind is that we have made this diagnosis, but have we also um, um, made a diagnosis of what the underlying cause is, malignancy being a particularly morbid potential disease association between factor eight in inhibitors, um, um, uh, that, that could be something that can sneak under the radar in this patient. Um, and then management, right, once we have made the diagnosis can actually be quite tricky. Um, I will not pretend like I understand the management, but it oftentimes involves immunosuppression, but it can also just, just, just for our, all of us, can be a very difficult disease to control, um, particularly in the in the early phases like this, where um, uh, uh, a delay in achieving adequate con control can be potentially cat um, uh, cat catastrophic for the patient. Um, so yeah, I'm very curious to see how this case um, uh, ends up unfolding here, if the bolus pemphigoid is thought to be the underlying diagnosis here, or if there was a, if there was a hunt that went underway um, to see if there was something else. And then the only other thing that I'll say in the malignancy category, but also sometimes plasma cell disorders, right? Probably not relevant in this case, but plasma cell disorders can also produce a laboratory signature con consistent with factor eight, to, um, factor eight inhibitor deficiency and the elevated out, um, uh, APTT. So that's another thing for us to keep in our back pocket if there's not a clear um, uh, definitive underlying etiology early on. But I'll kick it back over to you, Travis. I'm very curious to see if there's any other clo um, uh, closing information about the case. No, no, no more tricks. So um, a inhibitor was present at 1.6 uh, Bethesda units, kind of confirming you know, the diagnosis you all alluded to, which was a factor eight uh, inhibitor acquired hemophilia A. So um, basically, this case was just kind of demonstrating that uh, bolus pemphigoid is one of the autoimmune disorders associated with factor inhibitors. 
Um, you know, as I kind of put in the chat, you know, bullous pemphigoid is, it's, you know, just, you know, recapping on that, it's you know, a common autoimmune subepidermal blistering disorder, and it usually presents between ages uh, 60 and 80. And, um, you know, it can be caused, um, it can be idiopathic, but other things can cause it, including medications. Um, and this patient, after he was diagnosed, he was treated with activated prothrombin complex concentrate, and he was given an increased dose of steroids and then started on rituximab. Uh, his bleeding resolved, his PTT normalized, and his blisters continued to improve. So um, I just have a couple little pearls on here I'll share that, um, you know, the approach to a bleeding patient with an elevated PTT and a normal INR. So first, you know, excluding involvement of heparin. Next, check a mixing study, a one-to-one -one mixing study. If the PTT corrects, there's a deficiency of factors 8, 9, 11, 12, or von Willenbrand, von Willenbrand level, um, and you would check levels for that. If the mixing doesn't correct, there is a factor inhibitor. You should order a Bethesda assay, which demonstrates inhibitor and quantifies its titer. So um, acquired hemophilia is caused by autoantibodies that inhibit or um, increase clearance of a clotting factor. Uh, it can be suspected based on a bleeding diastasis, most often bruising, a hematoma or a mucosal bleeding, or incidentally, uh, abnormal coag tests. Uh, it can be associated with pregnancy, postpartum um, state, autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid and lupus, cancer, drugs, just uh, especially checkpoint inhibitors. Half of the cases are idiopathic. Treatment consists of supportive care versus immunosuppression, steroids, and rituximab. Um, and then another clinical pearl, antiphospholipid antibodies can also be cause isolated PTT elevation but APLS is rarely associated with bleeding. Um, check, uh, check for that if the PTT is high in the absence of bleeding or in the presence of thrombosis. I think Ravi had mentioned uh, APLS earlier, so um, just circling back on that. And uh, that's the case. Great job, you guys. You know, I think got it all from right, right in the beginning. You guys have really good schemas for this, so awesome discussion. Thank you so much uh, for bringing the case. Um, Ravi, um, Drew, do y'all have any reflections? Yeah, my reflection is thank you. Uh, it's an interesting case. Uh, I learned a lot uh, in terms of hemophilia AA in mixing studies and anticoagulation pathway. Yeah, it is an interesting case. Uh, thank you. I think I'll just go a little bit further and say that um, well, at least I know another complication of bolus pemphigoid now besides um, all of the uh, the skin blistering that happens. Um, and that, yes, blisters can bleed, but there is a point where the bleeding becomes too much. Awesome. Thank you so much. And just to clarify, um, I think one of the points I made earlier was confusing. So um, for if you're trying to differentiate like coagulopathy of liver disease versus DIC, you can check a factor eight um, because factor eight is not synthesized in the liver. So it should be elevated in liver disease, but um, should be low in DIC. But then you can also, if you're trying to differentiate them, check a factor five, both factor five and factor eight aren't vitamin K dependent factors. Um, and so that can kind of help differentiate as well. So sorry, I kind of messed up. Um, saying that point. And amazing job, Valley, um, doing it both teaching points and the case. Um, Jack, any final thoughts before Valley uh, concludes teaching points? I have nothing to add. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Travis, for the amazing case. So um, the patient presented with a uh, past medical history or recent diagnosis of Buddhist pemphigoid which is an autoimmune skin condition that causes large fluid filled blisters, often in the flexor areas, and it's more common in older adults. Uh, however, um, one of the teaching points that Travis mentioned was the fact that the patient was re relatively young for the age of presentation of this disease. And it's caused by IgG antibodies against imidesmosomes, which are part of the structure of the basal membrane of the skin. And so, um, Jack started us with a lot of questions about um, the, the, the 
kind of a basal disease the patient had, which was that if the bleeding, uh, there was a um, chief concern, was out of proportion to this disease progression or was part of the natural history of the bullous pain fluid, or maybe a side effect of the treatment or a complication as it was in this case. And, and Mary also mentioned um, that autoimmune diseases often go with autoimmune diseases. So we should rule out symptoms that suggest coexisting conditions. And then um, the approach new, to new bleeding was thinking about something affecting the vessel or the coagulation cascade. And so starting with damage to the vessel, something as trauma or vitamin related or a vasculitis like an inflammatory etiology that could damage the structure itself or something affecting the coagulation, such as primary coagulation, the platelets or thrombocytopenia, and secondary coagulation, uh, like the coagulation factors, bone builder run factor, or the possibility of acquired hemophilia as it was in, in the case today. And so some clues to differentiate the two were the presence of petechia and bleeding in gums that could uh, clue us to thinking about something affecting the platelets, whereas um, bleeding or hematrosis or bruising clues us closer to something affecting the coagulation cascade. But Jack mentioned that in the absence of hematrosis, especially in cases of acquired hemophilia, we should, not, we should not rule out the possibility of acquired factor inhibitors. Then the patient uh, presented with a PTT prolongation. So we started thinking of something affecting the intrinsic pathway of coagulation. And so um, there were like two possibilities um, that were gonna be differentiated by mixing studies like the presence of inhibitors, like it was in this case, or the coagulation factor deficiency itself. And so with the mixing studies, we differentiated the both. In the case of the presence of antibodies, the PTT will not correct because, well, um, there are going to be antibodies anyway. And so um, the test is not going to proof. And in case that there's factor deficiency, as we mix a normal serum and um, the serum of the patient, in case there's coagulation factor deficiency itself, there's going to correct because the test only needs 50% of the presence of the coagulation factors to give a, a positive or a correction in the PTT value. And also Travis mentioned that great peril, there was drugs that can cause bullous pain figures like lesions, which was, which was a differential from early on, the possibility of polypharmacy in this patient. And some of these um, medications were furosemide, spironolactone, and it said amoxicillin, PD-1 and pd one inhibitors were, were the main group, TNF-alpha inhibitors as well. And then, well, the final diagnosis was acquired hemophilia, which is associated with pregnancy, lupus, and medications. And uh, also a great pearl, which was quite interesting, was that in antiphospholytic syndrome, there can be acquired hemophilia as well, but it is rare that it presents with bleeding, as the most common presentation is with a thrombosis um, type um, case. And so um, thank you so much for this case. It was amazing and amazing discussion as well. Yeah. Yes, I think um, really uh, antiphospholipid syndrome leading to elevated um, APTT um, in the absence of bleeding um, usually. Thank you all so much. Have a great night.